Hello everyone and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. It is the show about plants. Plants, plants, maybe a plant disease or two. But anyway, we're here to talk about plants and so we're glad that you've joined us. My name is Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department and school is coming fast, so look out. And I'll be covering cut flowers and also I do like to talk about perennials. So now you know my expertise, but we're gonna find out who all these smart people are next to me at the table. And they're gonna tell you their uh, expertise and do a show and tell or, or an email. So Chuck Voigt, you're elected, you get to go first. Well, thank you, Diane. Uh, I was in the Department of Crop Sciences also. I retired at the end of 2015. My specialties were vegetables and herbs. But, you know, occasionally I can answer other things as well. Tonight, I've got a trio of questions about transplanting asparagus. They've, they've backed up on us, apparently. Uh, Jim moved into a house and has a small garden and has established asparagus, but it's all about willy-nilly all over the place, and he wonders, can he transplant it to one side without harming it, or should he just carry on with the chaos? Well, I would say if it's, if it's been there any time at all, the root system is gonna be enormous. A neighbor farmer actually transplanted some out of a fence row when he stopped farming that acreage, but he had a John Deere with a front end loader, and you, know, you get these six foot root balls. So uh, my recommendation would be to start a row of asparagus down the side where you want it to be, and then gradually phase out the older stuff that's all over willy nilly. As, as the new stuff gets up to its second and third year when you can, when you can start doing a good harvest. Um, the second person is Frederick, and he's started asparagus from seed, which is, which is fun because you get a, a pretty good variety selection. You can get some of the nice all-male things. Um, and he wonders how to, what's the best time to transplant that. I would probably do it first thing in the spring. You know, leave the, leave the top so you can find the row. Uh, dig them up, usually the first year the, the root mass will be maybe a foot across. Uh, then you want to dig a trench, you know, depending on your soil type. If you're in sandy loam like I was, you can dig down a foot or so. In heavier clay soils, maybe only seven or eight inches, but you want to get it down there. You want to want to set it with the buds facing up, of course, and then the roots kind of angling down if you can. And the reason you put all that soil over the top is then you can do some cultivation over the top because over time it does tend to come up and that gives you some time to help control weeds because perennial weeds are one of the banes of, of, mm -hmm. of asparagus beds. Uh, and then Lawrence, uh, he sees asparagus growing in fence rows and that goes back to, to my neighbor farmer. I uh, wonder what time of year you dig that up and transplant it. Again, usually those are just enormous and you would probably be better off to start with one-year-old one -year uh, crowns and, and, and do, do it that way because uh, it's, 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 it's exhausting and I'm not sure it's worth it because it's, the transplanting shock is gonna be really amazing because mm -hmm. there's no way you can get all the, all the roots of a you know, five, six, seven, 12 year old asparagus plant. If not more. Yeah. Okay, well thank you for that because asparagus is worth it but it's hard to transplant older ones. Okay, let's go to you, Jennifer Fishburn. Hi, I'm a <coughs> University of Illinois Extension horticulture educator covering Logan, Menard, and Sagamon counties. And this evening I'm going to start off with a viewer's email question about cover crops. Um, they'd like to uh, use cover crops in their home garden to improve fertility and correct compaction. And they want to know where in central Illinois they could find seed um, that they could purchase in smaller quantities. Um, so the answer is in central Illinois, it really varies on where you live anywhere in Illinois. Um, mail order is a sure bet. You can actually mail order. The unfortunate side of mail ordering is that um, you pay postage by the poundage. So um, it, it will be more ex it'll be more expensive to have it mailed. Um, you could try a local feed store. Uh, most of those, however, are going to sell it probably in 50 pound bags, so if you have friends and neighbors that you could share with, that would be a great way because usually you can get about as cheap as you can for a small quantity mail order wise. Um, but as far as uh, what you might plant, um, buckwheat is a nice one for a summer um, cover crop, just leaving a space in your garden to plant that, um, but make sure you mow it off before it starts to go to seed or you'll have buckwheat forever. Um, and then a good uh, fall crop would be oats or you could also try a winter rye. 
uh, oats will die back in the in the winter time, whereas winter rye will overwinter into the spring, and you'll have to find a way to uh, mow that off, till that under, and, and kill that plant. Um, so there's several options to that. Um, my suggestion is if you um, can use the internet, the University of Wisconsin Extension has a really good cover crops fact sheet for home gardeners that you might look at. And my little show and tell for this evening is a Cavella Hybrid Zucchini. And this is one that I've tried for this year. And I love it because it's thin skin, which is good and bad because coming out of the garden, it gets uh, skinned easily. Uh, but it is a nice one because it works well as a, a raw vegetable um, because of th the skin's edible, um, just like the others, but it's just a little more palatable because it's, it's very thin. Um, has a great cover color to it. And I think it's just a, a coincidence, but um, the squash bugs are less attracted to this one. They still get on it, but less attracted to this one than um, the, some of the other ones in my garden. So I think it's mm. maybe just coincidental, um, but that is spelled C-A-V-E-L-I. I love all of the descriptions, and I think that color would help you find it before you, uh, they develop into a baseball bat. <laughs> it so does, nice. it does. Um, compared to the dark green, um, this one is great because it does, it's contrasted very nicely with the foliage. Ooh, um, yeah. I'm gonna remember that. And the, and the plus of this one also is that the seeds, gets fewer seeds and they don't develop as quickly. So uh, the whole Sold. thing is edible. <laughs> <laughs> Next year, I'm gonna try that. I'm taking notes, Cabelli. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much for that. And now, Mr. Jim Schuster, let's go to you. Okay, I'm a retired uh, extension horticulturist and plant pathologist. And the, mine is, my pears are gnarly. What can I do to prevent it from happening again? Thanks, Mark. Well, um, there are several prob probabilities. First of all, there are two nutrients that if they're deficient will cause gnarly pears. One is calcium and one is boron. They're more likely to be deficient if you're on sandy soil. So I'm going to first <coughs> suggest a soil sample. Have those two products checked to see if you have adequate amount in the soil. Then you have two insects who won't be found late in the summer or even midsummer because they do their damage to the pears when they're just starting out and <coughs> wherever they feed that area stops growing which makes your pears kind of lumpy looking or gnarly. And the last one is pear scab. That's a disease that attacks leaves and the fruit. And it also, when the scab is on the pear, it stops growing. However, in all my years in extension and you know, 42 years of looking at diseases, I have never seen pear scab cause pears to be as gnarly as what we had in the pictures. So I would be looking at either the insects or the nutrients first. It's a shame to be first in that category. Yeah. Wow, <laughs> to be best in gnarliness. I'm glad he wrote that in. That's interesting yeah. about those nutrients. Okay, thank you very much. And now we're gonna go to the phone lines and we wanna hear uh, Jean's question on line one about crepe myrtle. Hi there, Jean. Is it line it's one? Plant. I bought an eight-year-old crepe myrtle that's in a uh, two-stadia spot. It's not growing a whole lot, and it's not blooming, so I want to move it to the sunny, the sunny spot. Okay. I have a crepe myrtle, but I've never moved it. Yep, me. Um, <clears throat> it would probably... How big is it, Jean? Is it... Uh, it's probably only about three feet. So uh, I, I guess I should say how old is it? How old are the... About eight years. Mm, that's sizable, but um, it'd be, I don't know if anyone else wants to answer, but it'd be typical woody transplanting. You might want to water it beforehand, probably do it in the fall. Do you think, or do you think crepe myrtle for the spring? Well, when I think crepe myrtle, I think kind of iffy hardiness. It, yeah. I, but I, she's I, got an eight-year-old one. I think mine's yeah, 15. But, but my point being... If you stress it in the fall, yes. it would make it more susceptible to winter injury than if you if you got it moved early I, in the I spring. Agree with I that. think. Yeah. I uh, would agree with that. And <coughs> I was going to say, would it be better because of the age of the plant? Just go get a new one and plant it where you want it. I wonder if she could actually layer it next year. Oh, that's true. And now, not this year. I don't think there's enough time, but actually do a layering of some of the shoots and 
wound it and have it down into the ground and try it in several spots. Uh, but if you do want to try, you would have to water that plant beforehand, make it a good root ball and have a lot of people who are willing to help you move it. Um, have this hole dug where you're going to take it so you don't yes. have it out of the ground longer than it has to be. And water that the day before <coughs> as well. And don't plant it any deeper than it was before. Mulch it. So it would be, but I would try layering. I, you know, maybe even start it this year and let it layer into next year. But it's just those lower shoots and you wound them and try them all around the tree if you've got room. They love shade for layering, and, I would and, think. And when you're layering it and you wound it, is, is it better to be right near a node? I would think so because right. it would help. Right. Um, you know. yeah, and then you, you pin it down with something or, put, right. or, or even put a rock on it yeah. or something yeah. so or it both. stays in good contact with moist earth. Right. So, so those are some <coughs> ideas. But yes, I do stand corrected. I think spring's better for crepe myrtle, but everything else could probably be in the fall. Okay. Well, let's go on. Thank you. Let's go on to Lynn's question on line two. And hey, it's about asparagus. <coughs> hi, hi there, Lynn. Hi there, how are you doing? Good timing on your question. <laughs> My question is, how do you eliminate weeds in an asparagus garden? <laughs> As we look at Chuck. <laughs> well, you start early and, and often um, and if you see anything that looks like it's a perennial weed, you want to get it out before it gets its its root system established because once they're in there, they're, they get intermingled with the asparagus roots and it's very difficult. Um, if you're not averse to things like Roundup, you could, you could take Roundup and paint it on the things that you don't want there and be very careful uh -huh. not to drip it on the asparagus. Sure. Uh, you know, kind of spot treat that way. But the best way is, is to keep them from ever being there. Uh, put a, a, a good mulch over it, which, which would make the ones that are there a little easier to eliminate, and um, try to go from there. But <clears throat> again, if you plant it a little deeper, especially early on in its life, you can, you can carefully cultivate over it, and, and that might help you early on in the, in the life of an asparagus bed. Okay, so we have a pretty thorough coverage <clears throat> of asparagus. Thank you very much for your question. Now, let's go to line three, and another Lynn has a question about Japanese beetles. Hi there, Lynn. Excuse me, my name is Marlene. Marlene, and you're line three? Okay. That's okay, yes. <laughs> Sorry, but Marlene, what is your question? The Japanese beetles this year just decimated our linden, mm -hmm. and I was told by the Extension Service that the better way to do that is to treat the soil in May or June, but I didn't have enough sense to ask what to treat it with. Okay. Mm. Who wants to? I don't remember. The, I don't remember the chemical off the top of my head. We'd have to look it up. Um, one of the chemicals you can use, and I don't know if I'm saying it right, is the um, it, and it is it's applied to the ground. You want to make sure that. Um, you don't have any mulch uh, over the roots, uh, over, the, over the soil, and you're applying it directly to the soil. Uh, the other thing to note, though, as well, is that um, be Japanese beetles, while they look as cause aesthetic damage to your linden tree, the um, overall health of the tree is not impacted by the damage from the, from the Japanese beetles. So if you want to treat that that's certainly uh, your privilege but um, it's not a necessary thing to do now you know if you have a prize rose bush that might be another thing to consider but generally with our trees um, the the dead, the damage is more aesthetic I understand where she's coming from though some of those lindens are just brown and they all got planted before the Japanese beetle started invading mm -hmm. so it's a rough well, you can drive down the interstate and pick out linden trees as you go <laughs> as you go along because they all look alike and last year it wasn't so bad the year before was terrible this year is terrible and, and it was very spotty this year it um, was. we we didn't i didn't have any damage at my place and i don't live that far from springfield but it was just um very very spotty i, I think it, mm -hmm. um, wow, you're so fortunate there, there, yeah i got about 20 linden in my two block area and not no damage Oh, I my. Haven't, I saw one Japanese beetle this whole summer. That's spotty. Yeah. That is very so. Who knows? Wow. 
Okay, as I'm thinking about how my linen looks right this moment. All <laughs> right, let's go to line four. Faye has a question about perennials. Hi there, Faye. Hi. Um, I wanted some ideas about perennials that I could plant in a very dry, rocky area. Full sun. Sounds like a almost a rock garden situation. Maybe. Um, I think you, of course, Jennifer is going to jump in too, but you might <laughs> think about thrift or armeria, A-R-M-E-R-I-A, -E um, maritima, which is sea pink or thrift. That takes it pretty tough. Um, about creeping flocks. Creeping flocks, I think. Maybe some of your sedums. Definitely well. sedums, for sure. The ones that they, they sell as um, kind of ground covers or I think the word they use, steppables. Um, those would work well, usually sold in multi-packs. Uh, those would be great choices. And lots of different kinds of those. Those are probably the toughest, um, but there are a lot of rock garden plants, and that's a whole specialty area. You might look into those. A hen and chickens would do it, and there's a lot of different hen and chicken varieties. Anyone else think of, I don't know if soapwort would do it. Um, that can take some drought, but um, this year a lot of people would find out what takes drought. Uh, in, in some of the <laughs> central and more southern areas of mid-America, not necessarily all the north areas. So those are some <coughs> ideas. It's Can not I also do some research on uh, what plants might be native to that specific area? Because mm -hmm. I'm assuming that if you have that type of a soil, um, it's probably a native soil. So you might look into um, what would grow natively and try some of those. Because once established, after usually about the first year or so, those um, really don't need a lot of care. They do, do establish pretty nicely. Okay. All right. Thank you for that question. And now we're going to uh, stick with a Rose question. And Phil has that for us on line five. Hi, Phil. Um, it's a John F. Kennedy white rose. And it, its leaves are doing great, except that it's a, they, there's appeared little white dots about the head of a pin on them and they're in groups of two to three to four and connecting, if that helps. Yeah, I think it's probably more an insect than a disease. Um, well, I, two insects uh, that I can picture with, well, first of all, it's not a true insect, would be mites. Uh, there are piercing, sucking, um, in, um, insect-like creature, and um, they can be on the bottom side, leaf on the top side, they could have done the damage early in the spring and disappeared. They're very small, so you have to look really close. They may hide out during the day and be more visible at sunrise and sunset or something like that. Um, also, um, if you, especially in the spring, are you still getting this in the spots? Are they still occurring or are they were there and you haven't gotten any more? Oh, we might have lost oh, him, but okay. anyway. Well, the reason I was thinking is, uh, like in May, June, and early July, there's fiddle bugs and they feed on foliage and stems, and they may cause some whitening of the foliage, not as bad as the mites. Uh, and then there's another possibility, because you said there were dots, um, but there are some viruses, and they tend to cause swirling as whitish, but I have seen some that are dot-like, so, um, and if you've got viruses, you're kind of screwed, because that means you, there is no control. You're gonna have to destroy the plant. But there are some miticides you can buy for the mites if that's what's causing them. And otherwise, there are some other piercing, sucking insects that may have come and left. And um, I can't think of exactly off the top of my head what may some of them mean, but. What, some kind of a bug or some kind of a leaf hopper? Or yeah, leaf those, hopper, one that's, those, that's, one that's one what I was thinking, yeah. yeah, leaf hoppers. Okay, so there's some possibilities for you. Okay, we're gonna go back to the panelists and <coughs> Chuck, what have you got for us? I've got a broccoli question, that's uh, from Carol. And they have many broccoli plants that seem vigorous. They're not producing too much. Uh, they started with a small head in the center and that quickly goes to flower. And then there's very few side shoots after they take out the center head. Is there a pollination problem? Uh, we don't really know how bro broccoli pollinates. Well, if you're not growing bro broccoli seed, then pollination is not an issue. Um, and in fact, if it gets like that picture that they just showed, uh, you have missed, you have missed the, the pick date. 
Uh, you want to you want to harvest them when the little individual florets just start to to show up uh, as individuals and take it off. And the size it is is the size that it is. And the sooner you harvest that original central head, the the, the faster side shoots will develop. And usually, the the larger they'll be. Uh, it could be a, a, a variety problem. Uh, sometimes uh, the stuff that comes in seed packets is an old green sprouting type broccoli, which was designed not to have a gi gigantic center head, but to have uh, more uh, smaller heads. Um, the other thing is, I don't, I don't know when you got the plants, uh, if, a, if a broccoli or a cauliflower plant is held in a cell pack too long, it gets very root bound, uh, it, it's, it's growth slows down, and, and they're, they're kind of on a timer. And so uh, cauliflower is really bad, broccoli also sort of bad. They make little button heads because when they get to the point when it's time to flower, whatever strength they have in the plant goes into that head, and that's, that's what you get. The nice thing about broccoli is that it does make side heads where cauliflower, if you get a head that's an inch in diameter, the plant's done. Uh, although, you know, if, if you like cold crop greens, the leaves are, are edible and you could do something with those. But hopefully that's covered some of the possibilities. That sounds very thorough. Thank you very much. Okay, Jennifer. Well, I might add to what Chuck said, and that is we've kind of, depending on where you're at, you may have missed the window of opportunity, but uh, one of my volunteers grows fall broccoli, uh, plants it late July, early August, and he brought in an October one year dinner plate size broccoli heads. They're absolutely beautiful. So it might be a timing issue too. So yeah, look, yeah, look yeah at if, it's, that. if it's trying, if it's trying to, to make heads right now, that, that's not anywhere near ideal. And I had mine fall one started and kind of turned my back for a week and the the cabbage loopers found them and I came back and, the, and everything <laughs> was gone, gone except the central veins so, oh. I, so I you know I've started with with BT sprays but it it it's going to set them back which which ticks me off because I had them started precisely Perfectly. the right time <laughs> sorry about that my show and tell so okay. is uh, you always have to add you know uh, my show and tell is cut plant um, I Picked this on the way out my driveway this evening. We have a prairie area, and uh, this was blooming, and it's absolutely beautiful right now. It's just started. Um, has that yellow kind of sun, you know, small daisy look to it. Um, but what this, how this plant gets its name is the two leaves, um, the kind of form there. I don't know if it's necessarily two, but they form a cup in there, um, and then that cup will hold water, actually. Um, that small small birds could drink out of um, when it does rain for some of us. Um, but it's absolutely beautiful at this time of year. It's just coming on um, and it will bloom for many, many weeks um, here on out. And the plant grows about four to 10 feet tall. This is one of our native plants. Um, so where you plant it really needs to be its permanent home. You're not probably going to divide this plant um, or move it after it becomes established. Very good, thank you for bringing that in. Okay, Jim, you're okay. next. Uh, I have raspberry diseases, and he wrote a lot of information, and I'll condense it down. He's grown raspberries for many years, uh, and all of a sudden, they, and he had good yields, and all of a sudden they started dying out in, in patches, and he's getting some new suckers coming back up, but not keeping up with how many are dying. Now, there are several problems that can be causing the dying out of raspberries. One is a cane mower, that's an insect, and you should be able to see a hole in the side of the canes, uh, and if that's the case, then you may be need to be spraying for insects. Uh, there is verticillium wilt. That's a soil-borne disease, and it kills the roots, and will travel up into the canes and kill them out, totally out. The new shoots that you're sometimes getting may be coming from the canes that have not yet been infected with verticillium, but if you've got verticillium in the bed and it's spreading, uh, especially in really wet conditions, uh, you're pretty much going to lose that whole bed. And then we have a disease called crown gall. It makes oh, holes about, I mean galls about that big around. They're often near the soil line within six inches, but it will also grow on the roots. And in, in whether it's on the cane or on the roots, it's fatal. It will eventually kill them. And then we have cane blight. That's a canker disease, and that should cause the canes to turn a, a very dark brown to almost blackish looking color. 
And so look for that. Uh, and if that's the case, you need to keep those pruned out so it doesn't keep spreading with rain or watering. And the last one, uh, or last two, is fire blight. That's a bacteria disease that's all associated with apples and, and a few other uh, plants in the rose family. Uh, that may or may not cause the tip of the uh, raspberry to bend over, generally not, but you may see a few of those. And that will start as a tip and work down and eventually kill the whole plant. And then the last one are the root rots. And they are going to be a problem where you have way too much water or poor drainage. So you've got a lot of possibilities and I don't have enough information to single them out. And I am glad I have raspberries. Because it sounds like there's a lot, but really just try to figure out maybe one or two. Oh, and one other suggestion. Oh, I think there's oh. not time oh. for one other. <laughs> I'm going to say get a new bed. Get a new bed. Well, thank you folks so much, and uh, thank you to Dan Pano. He, it's his last day. We hope you have a great week gardening. Bye-bye.